Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to our special Meet the Author event, uh, focused on this fantastic book, Up and Doing, Two Presidents, Three Mistakes, and One Great Weekend, Touch Points to a Better World. Our special guests today are Jim Harmon, the author of the book, and joining him in conversation, Watson Institute visiting fellow Brian Atwood. Let me just say a word about e each of our guests today, each of these extraordinary individuals, and, and, uh, and then I'll explain a bit more about how we're gonna structure this event. So Jim Harmon, after earning a degree in English literature here at Brown, and then also an MBA in finance from the Wharton School, went on to an extremely successful career, which continues today in the world of finance. Uh, Jim served as chairman and CEO of the investment bank Schroeder Wertheim and Company, and today is the chairman and CEO of Caravel Management LLC. That's the investment manager of the Caravel Fund, which is an emerging and frontier markets fund launched in 2004. But you know what's so incredible or equally incredible about Jim is his record of public service that, that really he established across his career. During the Clinton administration, Jim served as chairman, president, and CEO of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. And subsequently, during the Obama administration, he served as chairman of the Egyptian American Enterprise Fund, which is a private corporation seeded uh, by US government funds to promote the development of the Egyptian private sector. Uh, today, Jim is also the co-chair of the board of directors of the World Resources Institute, which does phenomenal work surrounding climate change and sustainability. Uh, all of this is accounted, uh, is, is described um, in Up and Doing, which again, I highly recommend to you. Um, turning to our next guest, Brian Atwood, uh, for those of you who don't know Brian or who haven't had the benefit of taking his courses here at Watson, let me just say a few words. Uh, Brian has served as a, a senior fellow and visiting scholar at the Watson Institute since uh, 2016, my own arrival here as director. Um, but that service at Watson for Brian came after an incredibly distinguished career in public service, diplomacy, and education. Among many other accomplishments, Brian served as the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, a USAID, during the Clinton administration. And prior to that, he had served as undersecretary of state for management. Brian had also served as assistant secretary of state for congressional relations during the Carter administration. As many of you know, Brian served as the dean of the University of Minnesota's Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Um, again, I thank both of you, Jim and Brian, for, um, for being with us today. To those of you in the audience, the way we're going to structure uh, this event today is that um, Brian and Jim are going to have a conversation. And um, as they're um, conversing, please feel free to come up with questions and just um, type those questions into the Q&A window uh, that you'll see in, in Zoom. And um, then we'll get to those questions uh, after just a bit of conversation. So thanks everybody to participating. And with that, Brian, let me turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much, Ed. And I know Jim would join me in thanking you for the, your leadership of the Watson Institute. It's, uh, we've both been on the Board of Governors and have watched closely as this institute has grown and grown and both in prestige and in numbers. So we thank you very much for that. Uh, Jim, I'm so honored to be asked to interview you on this, on your book. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed reading it, every, every word. And what a life, what a career, uh, what a fascinating uh, beginning. And I, I, I guess in terms of your association with Brown, you continue to be dedicated to Brown's future. And I, that's very much appreciated. But I'd like to start at the beginning, and, and you, you were an English literature ma major, as, as Ed mentioned. That seems a fascinating beginning. Uh, I know that it later must have played a role in, in your life, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about your, your time at Brown and how that led you into the kind of career that you followed uh, uh, subsequently. Thank you, Brian. It's, I'm delighted to join you in, in this discussion. Uh, Brown seems like a long time ago, but very fond memories. And I have been fortunate to continue a relationship with Brown 
over the years. Uh, I majored in English uh, somewhat because my father was an English literature major and he would um, often recite poetry to me, like, let us then be up and doing with heart for any faith, which I used as the title here. Uh, but I was often uh, discussing literature with my father when I was younger, uh, and my sister had the same decision. So both my father and my sister were English literature's majors, so I sort of followed in their steps. And I was always glad to do it because I loved reading, and it was a great major at Brown. Well, having read your book, it's quite obvious that you were an English major because it's well-written as well. So thank you for that. You went then on to Wharton and got into the finance, financial world and, and uh, at a time when it was really exciting and it was the new frontier in many ways. And I just enjoyed reading your stories about um, relationships because you put a lot of emphasis in your book on, on relationships. And I've, of, I've always been interested since I was an exchange student as a young person in sort of intercultural relations. And you start your book by talking about how you as an East Coaster um, began to understand better how people think and act in places like Utah, where you were associated with a company, and then in the West Coast, uh, where you actually were one of those smart enough to invest in, in, in Starbucks. Um, tell us a little bit about relationships and how you got into sort of understanding other, other cultures and approaches to, to business and life. I think I realized somewhat after my educational period that relationships were critical, certainly critical for me to understand people and to, to affect change. Um, it wasn't enough just to know the subject. Later on, I didn't just want to hire the most brilliant person. I wanted to hire people who could relate to each other and who understood interpersonal relationships. And they were the ones who could make change, much greater change. So I, I, I have, don't necessarily give me the most brilliant student, but give me someone who's a good student, but who knows how to relate to people. And that has been a principle that's guided me uh, for much of my life. I, I worry sometimes about the fact that um, the younger population in the last year or two have been very focused on the computer screen as we all sit at home. And sometimes we're not out meeting with people. And I think that's a loss. So it, it was one of the reasons I was motivated to write the book, to remind people that relationships are critical and different cultural relationships. And to talk a little bit about even in the United States, we have a lot of, a lot of different cultural positions in different cities. I jokingly say, you really need a passport to leave Washington and get to New York City, and to some degree, vice versa. I can assure you that's true, based on my experience as well. But then you, you ventured into, uh, into Europe and into Italy, and uh, there is a, a major difference, especially the business world in Italy. You refer to some people's derisive comments about spaghetti accounting and all sorts of things that you had to overcome. It seemed to me a pretty risky thing to do for someone starting off in your, in your business. Uh, the, the, when I actually merged our team of people into the firm of Wertheim, uh, we, they had a very good uh, presence in Europe, but that had been slowed down, hadn't been going anywhere. So we, we had a number of meetings and, in that regard, I, I could see that building an investment banking firm just domestically would not nearly be as attractive an opportunity as internationalizing it. So building our power in on our strength and our presence in Europe and later in Japan and Asia was, was critical to that decision. Uh, but at each country, of course, in Europe was a lot different. Most Americans realized that. And uh, through the office of, in Paris that we had, uh, Wertheim had at the time, I met some very interesting people in Italy and that led me to start to represent the Italian government state owned or state dominated company. And that led me into a lot of work in Italy during the late 1970s. 
was it i mean it was that part of the risk as a state nominated company i i, I you know we work very uh, together as some of the people may know i we're both in government and the clinton administration and and uh you were working in the xm bank and i was the head of usaid um we, there was a bias uh, uh, by us and the U.S. government about state-dominated companies. How did how did that work out? I mean, w was that part of the risk factor that you you had to consider? Uh, because the, the government always, changes a lot in Italy, as you know. Yes, <laughs> I, I've always been more tolerant of different government positions, and sometimes the government, our own government in the United States, was. Um, and so state-owned businesses, if they're doing good work, I'm, I'm often encouraging them to privatize at the right time. But during many of the years, I encourage them to do good work. So that was not only true in Italy, um, but it became true years later in, in Egypt. So to, to invest in or advise uh, countries which have a fair amount of state-owned businesses, we, sh we should look upon it as an opportunity, we Americans, to try to help them to transition into a, a larger private sector, as opposed to going in and being critical of them that they haven't done all the things we've done. I was trained as an investment banker, which was to, to get along with people, build relationships and to make change, and hopefully that would result in positive things. And I didn't, I wasn't trained to go in and criticize uh, and I did find in my years in, in the Clinton administration, often some of my good friends who I love dearly in different departments would, would travel with me to different countries and they would be critical of the leadership in that country. And I would, I would shake my head and say, well, why, why are we scolding them? And we just arrived. Let's see if we can't come to an agreement on some areas. Uh, but that was even true in the, when I was in the private sector. And um, the first transactions I did with a company, Montedison, with Fiat, uh, my partners in the firm thought that was the developing world. W what was I doing there? Either I must have a girlfriend there or, or there must be another reason. Why am I going back and forth? And we were doing a lot of business there. But it was a very fortuitous thing because we didn't have nearly the competition from the other American companies. And so we were able to build a presence there and Europe became an important part of, of our business. And that taught me that to be more open-minded, working with people of different cultural backgrounds, whether they be in the United States or anywhere in the world. And if we could help make change that way, I did not ever think of criticizing them when we first met. I thought much more trying to find areas of mutual agreement and, and then maybe we could gradually make change. Will you uh, forgive me, but you sound like a natural diplomat, I must say. I've taught, been teaching courses on diplomacy, and it's what I would recommend as well. If you're going to affect change, you need to have the trust of the people you're trying to, to encourage to reform, that's for sure. I agree with that. You, you must have, uh, some of our students, be fascinated by the, the time you spent uh, in I guess, generally called show business. I mean, you actually got into supporting Broadway shows and movies and things like that. Uh, how did that change your life, if, it, if at all? I mean, your, your wife, of course, was, a very, was an artist and uh, that was part of it, I guess. The, the relationship with the British, um, uh, most people think because we both speak the same language, it must have been an easy, natural relationship. Uh, but it what, wasn't so easy. I often tell people that when we came to an agreement to partner, uh, the chairman of Schroeder's, George Malenkoff, said, we should have a serious conversation. And uh, in this serious conversation, he said to me, so if there were difficult times, what would you cut out of your cost basis? And I said, well, it's pretty easy. Go be the first thing I'd cut out was our dining rooms and our cars and all the luxury items we have. And he looked at me and he said, Jim, that's the last thing that we would cut out. If we cut that out, people would know we were in trouble. And so I realized even in two countries, which we have a long history together of friendship and respect, and one which, quote, we speak the same language, there was a big cultural difference in how we would conduct business. So it's not 
as simple as it might seem. Now, of course, in other countries, which you don't speak the same language, it's even harder. But I have found common ground in a lot of countries uh, like Egypt and all over Africa. Uh, so it, it's only a question of understanding people and trying to listen closely and then trying to find common area. Yes, uh, and that theme comes through in your book, just it's uh, constantly through from page one all the way to the end. It really is impressive. That's clearly the secret to your success. But I'm sure that uh, people here uh, want to know, you know, the, about the famous people you met, um, the movie stars. <laughs> can you say, this isn't People Magazine, but can you say anything about uh, your work in that field? Uh, I think that the, the work, uh, I was grateful that I, by pure, I'd say, accident, I didn't know it when I first chose to go into the financial community, that I would have an opportunity to, to work with different companies, with different backgrounds and in different countries. So I was never bored. I always found what I did exciting. I would wake up in the morning and I would look forward to getting to the office um, every day. Um, there were problems, of course. There were some industries that were more exciting People would say Hollywood was more exciting. Certainly financing motion pictures was exciting because everybody was interested. And I had all sorts of privileges to look at new releases before they were released. And I could look at them. The music industry was very exciting. But most interesting to me was that one week I'm in Italy working on uh, with the largest pharmaceutical company in, in Italy to consider a public offering in the United States. And how would we do that? And then I'm on a plane to... California working on motion pictures, that later on, um, the financial community became much more structured and people were specialist by industry sectors. And so mm. many others who joined the uh, investment banking world and later the private equity world never had the opportunities to move back and forth. I, I was very fortunate to be able to have this kind of diversification of activities both geography, culture, um, and and people, and being in a in a firm that hadn't yet gotten to that structured state, um, it was it was a very exciting period of time. I would never trade as much as I loved the public sector, and I, I really was ready to go into the public sector. But later on, I I very much enjoyed my private sector experience. Yeah. Well, there is there is one anecdote in your in your book that I was fascinated by. You were often, as some of us were, uh, invited to go to the White House to view uh, movies uh, that first that first came out. And I remember you saying to Hillary during the the first lady, uh, by the way, Hillary Clinton, that you didn't particularly like that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, yeah, I agreed with you. I, I wasn't much of a diplomat there, I have to tell you that, because first of all, I'm invited to to go to the movies. I think I think that was, you know, even before I went into the government, 1994, as I remember, um, right. I remember the movie because it, uh, I, I was so excited about it all, but it was one of the worst movies I remember seeing. Uh, and uh, I never the cast was present in, in the in the room. Um, and I think it was called Wolfman, uh, and and Jack Nicholson was in it, a talented performer, very good director. Uh, I left. No, I didn't leave. I I went out, went to excuse myself. It's a small theater in the White House, and there may be twenty people there, twenty five people. And by the way, when they go, the usual procedures you invite the cast and the director and the producer. So they're all sitting around there. And so the last thing you want to do is criticize anybody on the movie. So I sort of excused myself for, for a moment and Hillary happened to be outside. And I looked at her and she said, what do you think? I think she knew by my expression. And I said, who picks the films? She says, he does, he does. I said, well, don't you have anything to say about us? None, he picks it. And, if, and you should tell him what you think about this. So he knows he shouldn't pick these 
kinds of movies and she's telling me what to do. I say, I'll definitely say it at the right moment, but I'm not, I'm going back in now to be a, a, a mini diplomat, as you said. And I, so I did watch the film. Uh, subsequently, what people, those days, the Clinton administration was very, um, I would say, relaxed. It was almost like a fraternity. It Almost every few days, I would get a call from one of the two secretaries to the president saying, President would like to know whether you want to go to this movie or that movie. I became smart enough in time to ask, what's the film? And then I would say, I have to check around. And frankly, I got privileged after a while. I, if I checked it out and it didn't look interesting to me, I would excuse myself. There were just so many movies I was prepared to go. Now, it was very nice to talk to the president afterwards and to see some of the other people from the cabinet afterwards. But I, I, I wasn't about to go as often as they had movies there then. Well, I actually had the privilege of watching movies with the president on Air Force One. And I have to tell you that he, the, the, the sound was up so high, I couldn't believe it. I asked someone why. And apparently the president has a little bit of a hearing problem, but especially on an airplane. But so that, was, that wasn't a lot of fun either. But um, well, you, um, your work in the financial industry was at a time before technology, a lot of it. I mean, now that it's changed, you're still in it. Um, but but I, I guess I'm not an expert, and you are. So I have to ask a couple of questions. I mean, I did read the book called The Big Short, and we know this, the subprime mortgage crisis and how that created a global crisis back in 2007 or so. Um, what is your view? Is it too heavily regulated? Did Dodd-Frank fix the problem? Did the Sarbanes-Oxley bill uh, take care of uh, more transparency in the way people do business? Uh, are we uh, going to see any more crises uh, in, in the financial industry? Uh, one of the things that I learned was that uh, we're pretty good at solving problems once the crisis occurs. Yeah. That is true internationally as well. When a crisis occurs and we have to work together as we did in the Asian crisis and as we did in the Mexican crisis and so forth, we, we really focus on it and we get the other ministers of finance together and others and we are able to come to a conclusion. I think that's, that's quite satisfactory. Um, I, I'm pleased with what I saw in terms of resolving this. Um, I'm not as pleased with what I saw in planning for it. Um, so I, I'm, I, if, I, if you ask me, there were things that took place during the late 1980s before, um, bef before the SNL crisis, which probably weren't the best things that we could have done. But once we saw it, we formed the Resolution Trust and so forth. Good work was done. So I'm I'm relatively impressed with our ability to solve problems. I'm not impressed with the world or our ability to anticipate problems and act beforehand. So there are some things happening now, even that we could be doing differently. But I know once we get there, we'll we'll be able to to solve it, but not so good in ex, in preparation for it. And that's true right at the White House, right down. We, we, we just either politically or because of all the other things going on, we're just not so good at anticipating and making decisions beforehand. I, I couldn't agree more. And my theme a lot as the head of AID was prevention. I mean, can we invest in prevention? Can we get out ahead of it? Can we detect the fault lines in a society and hopefully help the society get beyond the pending crisis. Uh, but you, you, you know, unfortunately, got, people are responding to the headlines in government, as you saw. But we both were involved in the Asian financial crisis. We both were involved in trying to lift Africa uh, up. Uh, we both were involved in, in what was happening when the countries in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union tried to convert to capitalism. Um, you took a lot of risks. I have to really commend you for what you did as an ex, as the head of XM. Um, 
I'm, I'm thinking about it in my own terms. I, I tried to take some risks as well, but you were you were taking making loans, um, trying to bring liquidity to some of these countries that didn't have uh, active banking systems. Um, tell us a little bit about what it was about your makeup that caused you to take these kinds of risks, most of which paid off. I think I was trained as a, a, in the French community to, to understand problems and to understand people and to try to solve problems. And so I, I thought of myself more as a problem solver. Um, often I tell the story that I was only at the export import bank, maybe it was three or four months when what, the Thai, actually two months when the Thai bot collapsed and it was clear that Asia was heading towards some difficult times. Four months later, um, we had a meeting with the senior people at the bank and I remember saying to them, do you think we should make a trip over and evaluate what the situation is? And I remember my co- some of my colleagues saying to me, if we go, we're only going to hear complaints. They're going to ask for more money. And I thought, wow, maybe, maybe we'll be able to solve it. Let's try to be more positive. I was surprised by the reaction. No, I said, I think if we go, we'll learn something. And maybe we can be able to make, make some suggestions. It stayed in my mind. I did decide to take the trip and I took six or seven of my top colleagues over to Asia, and we were able to evaluate it, and we were able to make a significant difference. Uh, I'm very pleased about that. It's, a, it's an experience I had that um, means that people coming from the private sector, even if they haven't spent their lifetime in the public sector, and that for all those people who are listening now who think what they might do someday, I encourage them to think doing something in the public sector, whether it be locally or or, or nationally, but my experience uh, going to an agency I knew very little about, uh, being able to to go and see the crisis as it was. I visited Korea uh, in in the late fall that time, and I had never seen anything like it. The Koreans were were so ups- concerned and upset about economic conditions, and they were donating their own jewelry, their, their gold, and would put it into a pot in the streets. And they were so serious about saving their country. Um, and I met the new president there, and I remember leaving there thinking, I had, I had not seen that kind of dedication. This country would survive this problem. And we in the United States, who had invested close to $50 billion between the Korean War and later on in a number of other areas, we, we had to act. We had to find a way to help Korea get through this financial crisis. And their economy had come to a standstill. So they had none of the resources necessary to buy raw materials or spare parts to keep the economy going. And I came back to the bank and I said, what experience have we had in dealing with this kind of thing? And I dealt with everybody. And I said, we, there must be a way that we can help them by lending money or by as it turned out, confirming letters of credit, we could we could support the banks there, and we did it. And when we announced that we, among within the Exxon Bank, that we were going to do it, some of my senior people said we will lose money. I said that's maybe I'm betting that the Korean people are very credit worthy, and we can help them get through this difficult crisis by merely supporting their banks first. So we analyzed 15 banks and we came back and they said, 14 of these banks are insolvent. And I said, I don't care if they're insolvent. They're not gonna default on us because people don't default on the United States easily. And frankly, Korea is too credit worthy to default on us. We made them initially a billion dollar loan and then another billion and we were paid back every single dollar and it, resulted in a lot of business for the United States selling raw materials and spare parts to Korea. And it led us to do the same in Indonesia and, and in Thailand. But it was an interesting experience. I don't have time to tell the whole story. What's equally interesting was that the full-time staff who worked on it, and there were a lot of them at XM, I would go in on a weekend. They were working Saturdays and Sundays. I People had told me they didn't work hard at the XM Bank. Well, this was an agency when faced with the crisis, realizing how important it was. Public sector employees got into it and really did a great job. 
the difference between the public sector and the private sector, which was for someone like myself a little surprising. In my private sector investment banking, by October or November, maybe even earlier, the people who'd worked on that program in the private sector, they would be coming to me saying, I hope you're going to factor this into the bonus you pay, or they'd be writing me memorandums about what they achieved. No one did that in the public sector. So I had to ask them, how, how are we doing November 15th? Oh, Mr. Chairman, they said, we, we have made 2,404 individual transaction loans, and we have not lost one penny. That really prompted me to do a study on on how we did it and why we were so successful. And why they didn't actually share that with me was because that they weren't accustomed to coming in and telling me how great they did. So credit to the, to the workers at XM public sector for working this hard, for helping us to do that. Enormous difference we made to, to Korea and to Asians at that time. So I'm particularly pleased on that particular story. Well, you, you gave them a vote of confidence at the time they really needed it. You were right in assessing the, 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 the culture. And, and I mean, it's a little bit like the Marshall Plan. When we went into Europe, we knew that people understood uh, had, they had been industrial societies. All they needed was resources and a vote of confidence. And that was really helpful, in addition to, of course, encouraging them to work together as a union rather than as a separate co economies. But um, I'm, I'm, I've been, I was very impressed by what you said about people that work in the public sector, because that's my experience as well. But there is such a reputation. I mean, lazy bureaucrats. I mean, you hear it all the time. And of course, mm -hmm. the government now is attacked uh, merciless, mercilessly by people who don't know better, I think, and most of them ide ideologues that want to see it that way. But that was, a, that was a very impressive part of your book to read how dedicated. I happen to know very well one of your economists, I think Rita uh, Rodriguez, I think her name was. She was very impressive because she was, she attended, I was the chair of the OPIC board, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. I want to, I want to um, get into your work rec more recently now, the, the Egyptian Enterprise Fund, um, I was around when those enterprise funds were created and there was a good deal of worry about how they would be operated. And uh, they were designed mainly to come into a country whose banking system just wasn't doing the job that a banking system should do, providing liquidity to an economy that needed it, investing in, in industry and getting the country back uh, on, the, on, the, on the road to success. When, when I was in the administration, there was something called the Gore Mubarak uh, meetings. Twice a year, we would meet with the top officials. And the main goal was to privatize the Egyptian economy. And I remember receiving some briefings that were just a lot of smoke and mirrors. It, they just didn't seem to be able to pull away from the quasi-governmental uh, parastatals that they were running. And yet now it seems that they've gotten the message. Um, and your enterprise fund has been very successful. T talk a little bit about the Egyptian economy and how the enterprise funds have played such an important role. Yeah, I, I'm um, delighted to have the opportunity to talk about this. I think it's a very important part. It was may, maybe the major reason that I wrote the book, that hopefully uh, the government would realize that we can scale up this program called enterprise funds and help a lot of other parts of the world. Um, so for me, I took the assignment in 2011 um, when uh, Hillary Clinton first had approached me on it and I met with people at state and at, at AID to discuss it. I knew very little about the program. Uh, and unfortunately they hadn't kept a lot of good records that memorialized the enterprise funds that were formed in 1990. So I made a point of contacting the former chairs of six uh, of the enterprise funds. There were about 11 that I reached and they spoke very highly of the experience they had and the difference they made and some of the criticism they also made, but I learned a lot that way. Uh, there, there were some reports in the government about the experience in the 1990s, which they was not shared with me. I learned later on, which disappointed me a little bit, but needless to say, 
I made the decision to, to accept the, the, the challenge. And I went over to Cairo in uh, late 2012, I guess it was. Uh, it was a very chaotic time. It was a lot of violence in the streets and a lot of danger. Um, and I, uh, I insisted uh, in, in meeting not only, of course, the government at the time, uh, which I was invited to do, the government of Egypt thought that we should just give them the $300 million that the Congress would authorize to create this fund. By the way, Enterprise Fund is, is, is created to help the private sector to grow, and it, it does it by making investments that hopefully are credit worthy, where we don't lose money for the United States government, but where we're job creating and doing a number of other things I think that are important for the society. Um, so a lot of good intentions and the enterprise funds of the 1990s did reasonable. The, the, the United States got most of its money back, but they didn't do nearly as well as we have done. And that's not because of our brilliance in some way, it's because the times have changed. And I tell everybody, our success in Egypt was because of three major factors that have changed over this 20 years, one of which is talent that exists in these countries. There is human talent in a lot of the developing and frontier world that can now manage businesses, can now identify business opportunity, and can play a role in investing and building the private sector. Two, there was capital flows coming in that wasn't before, flowing into much of the developing country world. And three, it's technology. Technology has given opportunities for people to invest. So technology, human capital, and, and real capital has made a difference. So the enterprise funds that were then launched uh, in 2008 uh, by President Obama, those enterprise funds actually, 2011, I'm sorry, 2011, those enterprise funds had the benefit of these developments. So when I was asked to do Egypt and I compared the two, I, I, I sort of knew that we ought to make, be able to make a difference. The chaos that existed in Egypt, and I tell a story that I needed to take out of the book. I did not include it in the book, although the first draft I wrote the story was, it was a wonderful opening. I arrive in Cairo with a, a, my assistant, who was a, a woman, an Egyptian woman who knew it well, and someone from the State Department, a young woman from the State Department, and we are, we are driving to have a, a, a meeting with the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and uh, it's late at night, and our car was passed where the riots are taking place. We are forced to stop, and there's tear gas all around, and it, it, it's quite a dangerous time. We're stuck in that car for two and a half hours. Fortunately, we did not have uh, uh, on the side of the car anything, no, no flag, but in small print, it said the United States State Department. So it was an unusual evening, to, to say the least, the two and a half hours. And the only thing you had in those days, I had a BlackBerry, not an iPhone. I, I looked at my first message on the BlackBerry. It was from my dentist, who was reminding me that I had a dental appointment on Monday and, and I ought to be on time. I thought, oh God, I should only be lucky enough to get there. But that was the beginning of my trip to Egypt. We, we were eventually, we got there that evening and it was a very unusual meeting all the people that we met with are now either gone or in jail. But uh, that story, uh, my friends in, in Cairo felt I shouldn't include in the book because it would set the wrong mood. And, and there's a lot of strong feelings about that. So I, I did take that out. It's interesting when you write a book and you send it to people who have to make comments, including some very well political figures, as well as some people in Egypt. They all have strong feelings. And so you have to take that into consideration as you make changes in the book before. Someday I'm going to write a book on things I had to take out. But meanwhile, the, 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 the story and our experience in Egypt at the beginning of that, I, I did realize that with no one investing in Egypt, and for those listeners who don't know it, um, Egypt has a population of 104 million people. One in four Arabs live in Egypt. It's an extremely important country to the United States and to the Middle East. And in the chaos that they had and with the violence that was then in the streets, it was clear to me that we could make a difference. We could make a difference. The, the people in Egypt are extremely capable 
And we've been fortunate to make investments that were, I can get into that were very successful. But if you were with me at the beginning, you might be questioning my wisdom as to what I was exactly doing at that stage in my life, stuck <laughs> in that particular moment. Well, it's no question that there has been progress, both in terms of privatization and as a consequence, uh, growth in their GDP. I think when I was going to meetings over there, it was a, it was a negative uh, growth in GDP at the time and no exports, no, no real, no activity going on. Um, the problem to, today, I'll ask you, you may not want to comment, you're still involved in Egypt, but is the extent to which the military is, is involved in the economy, to the extent to which military officers have, are, are investors in the economy. Um, obviously, the, the, uh, the fact that there's, it's a fairly authoritarian environment now. What impact will that have in the long run? I mean, clearly it's, it's, it seems to be stable now and working well, but what impact would you think that'll have in the long run? Well, uh, this is uh, such a long story that I'm going to try to make it very short. For one thing, um, the human capital in Egypt is is very high, and there's a, there's a lot of talent there. And uh, when we got there, uh, no one was investing. So naturally, if you go back to Warren Buffett's type statement, time to invest is when they're throwing them out the window. Uh, that was a moment in Cairo, no one was investing. So naturally we did well in our, in our investments, but the human capital was, is, is excellent and, and the work ethic is excellent. And so our, our success there, and for, for the listener, we've invested about $250 million now on behalf of the United States taxpayer. And the market value of our investment today is about $700 million. So we have made more money for the United States taxpayer than any other enterprise fund ever before. And I've been fortunate because the program, having initially been launched by Republicans under President Bush one, and then picked up by President Obama, and both political parties think they invented enterprise funds, which is kind of a break for me. So when I testify, I don't have one side shooting at me and the others, actually they're, they're both taking credit for enterprise funds and for our success in, in Egypt. But our success in Egypt is really not due to my billions in any way, it's due to the, the people that helped us find investments. And we, we did something early on that I, I, I think probably was the most important thing. The Egyptians did not wanna take our money and work for the United States government. And they didn't wanna work for, excuse this, Brian, they didn't wanna work for USAID and they didn't really wanna worked for anybody other than themselves. And so I realized I couldn't just hire someone and say, I'll pay you this amount of money. That didn't work. Uh, and that allowed me the opportunity to say, you will run the business. We will, we will form a private equity business and you will own it. And we will, you will manage our assets and we will pay you a fee for managing those assets. And so a very capable man, who had worked in New York at one of the investment banks who I met. Uh, I, I actually tell the story that I, I interviewed 20 odd people on the, at the third or fourth trip back to Cairo and they all were very good, but I didn't know if any of them could really run the program we needed there. And I asked uh, my assistant, Ola El Shawarbi, who was a very capable young woman, who was the Warren Buffett of Egypt? And she said, it's Norse of Sawiris. And I said, let's talk to him. She said, you can't, he's in London. So we picked up the phone and called London. And we're sitting there in the, in, in the square in Cairo. And I said, would you see us? And he said, come on over tomorrow. We went to the airport the next morning, flew to London, we went with him. He looked at all the names. He said, none of these people are your people. I'm gonna tell you who can do this. He's an Egyptian who's had experience in advisory work and so forth and so on, the right kind of, gets him on the phone, we talked to him, and I invited him to New York. Literally the next week he comes over and I met him and making a fast story very short, uh, we decided to work it out where he would be forming a private equity business to invest in those businesses and he would be managing our assets. And to this day, he does that for much of what we've done, but he has organized a team of Egyptians who are very capable. If I would have hired any of them in my investment banking days. They all were outstanding people. 
And if you read our, our impact report, uh, which is prepared for second annual impact report, measuring not just the financial returns, which have been approximating 20% per annum since we started investing. That's quite extraordinary. We talked to 20% per annum in the United States, but we have done it in Egypt. And if you look at the impact we've made, job creation, gender balance, all of the impact, we're I, I'm more proud of the development impact than I am of the financial results, which is why I felt so strongly about writing this book, because I, I thought if, if Washington really understood how we did it is pretty simple stuff, we could scale up the enterprise fund program. For those members of Congress who say, well, we didn't do so well with the 1990s, they realize they have to realize times have changed with technology as it is and human capital as it is now. You can do this in sub-Saharan Africa. We can do this in Central America. We can do this in so many poor parts of the world now with the same approach that we have taken in Egypt. I'm not gonna do it, but I'm sure happy to give any advice to people to do it. But the United States should do this now. And if we if we tilted it towards sustainability, if we tilted it towards the environmental challenge, we mm -hmm. could provide the funding for these poorer countries to make the transition to, to the non-carbon world. That's critical in my judgment uh, right now. So great opportunity. So my excitement over the realization of the Enterprise Fund success in Egypt can be scaled to a much bigger level means this is the moment in time where we can do it now in a number of other countries, and we can be helping these countries to transition into a decarbonized world. Well, your, your excitement about it really comes through, uh, Jim. And I, I want now, you're also, you, you're involved in everything that's important nowadays, it seems to me. <clears throat> you're co-chair of the World Resources Institute, which I've always thought of as the best think tank on climate change and environmental issues uh, there is. I mean, it's just a fantastic place. My uh, new Gus Beth, when he started it, it was much smaller. And then Jonathan Lash and you came along and, and it's now huge and it's making a big impact. Um, we just had the Glasgow summit on climate change um, there was an article I know we've both read in the New York Times about the fact that the private sector was very active. This particular writer thought it was too active uh, compared to the governments. But uh, tell, tell us, give us your reflections on, on where we are on climate change now and, and what role can the private sector play versus government or either or both. So if I can maybe phrase it in the sense that the young people who may be listening, who are wondering what they could do that would be good and interesting, and maybe even rewarding psychologically as well as financially, I, I, I encourage them to think about doing something in the public sector like I did. I encourage them to think about doing something in the NGO world if they're interested in the environment, because it's an enormous opportunity now the World Resources Institute is a good illustration of that. I, um, I tell a story that um, when I was first invited to take the position in government, I got a call from Al Gore, uh, who was tipping me off that the president was going to call me. And he said, me, Jim, uh, give me your email address. And I remember putting my hand on the phone, and this is 1997. For those young people who will think this is a strange story, I put my hand on the phone and I turned to my assistant and I said, do we have email here? 1997, doesn't seem that long ago. I didn't even know that. Uh, then he told me that, that they're going to invite you to be chair of the Exim Bank. And I thought to myself, I ought to check and see what the Exim Bank does. That's how little I knew. So for the young people who think they have nothing to offer, you don't have to be brilliant in terms of knowing what the government is. If, if you really care about it, you can make a contribution that's important, both in terms of public service, as well as in terms of now in, the, in, in climate. Because the brief story I will tell you about the World Resources Institute is, is an illustration of that. During my early years uh, at the XM, I had no prior 
literally no in-depth prior experience with the NGOs, especially on, on environmental considerations. And we were living within a, 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 a piece of our charter at the Exim Bank that required us not to finance um, projects that were uh, environmentally damaging. Um, and so we had some limitations there. The only two things that guided us at the Exim in financing exports were that they had to be creditworthy and they had to be um, not damaging to the environment to make it very simple. So, um, and that's the thing that had guided me there. During that period of time, it was often I had meetings with a number of well-known environmental groups who would scream or raise their voice. I wasn't used to that as an investment banker. I tried to deal with people in a low key manner and tried to reason with everybody. So people who, who, who used, as Jonathan Lash used to say, a shrill voice, they turned me off a little bit. The only ones who didn't were WRI. And they would try to explain to me that everyone's kind of excited, Jim. They're all worried about this. That's why he yelled. He really is a good person and, and so forth. I became very fond of Jonathan because he would help me to get through those meetings. At XM, I decided to do something different. I said, well, if I don't know this group, we're going to have a brown bag lunch once a month with the environmentalists. And we invite them in. And we did that on a regular basis. Often it was unusual meetings, but Jonathan was probably the most one of these easiest people for me to deal with. Afterwards, Jonathan said, would you join the board? I did join the board. It had some great people. Bill Ruckel's house was then the chair and Gus Speth, your friend, uh, is, still used to come to the meetings between Gus and Jonathan and Bill. I mean, these were historic figures in the environmental movement. So I was overwhelmed by their knowledge and experience. And it was my an honor for me to be on that board. And then a year or two later, they came to me, Bill came to me, and Gus and, uh, and Jonathan into my office and said, we're gonna ask you something very serious. Would you become chairman? I had no idea it was coming. And so I had just been building a new fund to invest in the developing world. And of course I was honored and I accepted. That day, uh, the WRI had been kind of like stalled out. We had about 120 full-time employees and our annual budget was about $14 million. Uh, I knew after going to a number of meetings a year or two that uh, we, we had to do something to, to create a little more excitement about what WRI was doing. And so I went to Al Gore, who had asked me to join the government and who and I had become friendly. And I said, Al, you got to join the board. He said, Jim, Every environmental group asked me to join a board. I can't join WRI without going to uh, Sierra Club and, and, and NRDC and so forth and so on. So I said, Al, you got to do it for me. And I put it right on the table. And so he said, yes. When he joined the board of WRI, that changed around a little bit. First of all, the staff were overwhelmed and pleased and impressed that I could get them. Secondly, it was clear that the board changed a lot. That was a turning point. And then we were able to add in a lot of very good people. Fast forwarding 15, 16 years later, we now have some uh, uh, annual budget of, of $200 million a year, up from $14 million. Uh, And we raised this money and succeeded during a period of time when, when the governments weren't led by people or the presence weren't always sympathetic with our mission at WRI in terms of sustainability. Um, but a lot of good people worked on a lot of good programs. I became enormously excited by the programs um, and the good we would do. And I'm still very excited by it. I think WRI is a great institution, but for those young people listening, you wanna do something in this area, you, maybe you're not gonna get an offer from the government, but think about an NGO, what you could do with an NGO doing some very good work. It's a great experience and you will have a terrific opportunity. Um, so to get to answer your question, it's a long-winded answer because I'm very enthusiastic about WRI and I'm actually uh, the new president, Ani Descupta, who is a terrific person replacing uh, Andrew Steer, uh, he and I are writing a book right now about WRI and about, Wonderful. I'm, op, I'm cautiously optimistic. I feel that the, the conference just over um, was more successful than people realize. Two 
with 200, of them, made 200 countries attending, major institutions and banks and all the others that have attended. It, it did remind me of Davos. And as I said to you in an email, I, I, I took that as a positive factor. The world is focusing now. We, we, we've seen what we had to do and we made some real progress. Yes, we have a lot to do more. I specifically am concerned about providing finding a way to provide the funds for the developing countries and the frontier countries to transition into the decarbonized world. And we, it, it combines everything I've done the last umpteen years. It, if we use enterprise funds in a way to provide um, funding for the developing and frontier countries and tilt the mission towards sustainability, we, we could do it on a credit worthy basis with a lot of talent in many of these countries. We could do it in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and so forth. So it's everything I've been talking about today. Plus, we would be providing the funds. Probably we could, we could get ourselves making a contribution, but if other countries did the same, we would get to the number needed. We would get to $100 billion for the world. And I think we're heading there. And I'm encouraged by what I saw it. Scotland and I'm in, I think next year in Egypt, uh, it, it, it's the opportunity of a lifetime for me because it's Egypt and everything we're doing in Egypt together with the environment and together with the momentum coming out of Scotland, we have a chance in that next conference to be able to announce that we have raised all the funds that we promised the poorest countries of the world to transition to a decarbonized world. That, together with everything else we've done, we're going to beat this problem. We are going to beat this problem. I am more convinced of it than I have ever been before. It's a terribly difficult, challenging problem that the world faces, but working together with much of the world, and now industry, together with labor, together with every, every aspect of life in the United States, we're going to solve this problem. Well, I really, <clears throat> the, that kind of optimism is absolutely what's needed as well. Uh, there's just too much uh, pessimism about it all. And I, I agree with you. <clears throat> we, we first met in, in a place called Haiti. And it seems to me that you, you've really um, done so much, uh, you know, for the developing world. And I think this $100 billion a year is really essential if this is going to, this is going to happen. And that commitment was made five years ago in Paris and hasn't been met, but it has to be met if we're going to do this. I'm going to end, I'm going to ask people, I've got one question up here uh, already, and I'll ask that question, but I, I want, I really wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you be, about yourself and your own orientation uh, toward public service and government and all of the rest. Um, I was impressed you, you got into politics by helping David Dinkins, the, the former, was then the former mayor of New York, and uh, you helped him raise money. You raised money for Bill Clinton, uh, yet you were, you were, I assume you still are a Republican, but you were in a, the Democratic administration. You've been uh, interested in the developing world. You're interested in climate and uh, in the environment. Um, you're, a, you're a bridge builder. You're able to talk to people on both sides of the aisle in such a very effective way. What, what do you think about the politics of this polarized country at this juncture? Uh, full, full disclosure, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Republican today. Um, I was, um, when I moved to the small community, which we still have a home in, in Western Connecticut, it was largely Republican. And if you wanted to be on the board of education and my children were young and I was determined that they didn't have to go to private school way, I wanted them to go to public school. The only way I could make a difference was to join the board of education. And so I put, I put down whatever party was in power that could get me a seat on the board of education. That's, that's the candid description. Right. I joined, I did join the board. I became the vice chairman of it, um, and I was glad to do it because it means that for four years I could play a role in my children's education. Before, shortly after I 
my oldest and graduated. I then became active at Brown and became a trustee at Brown. But um, I, I have always been a moderate. I, I was more of a moderate Republican even when I was young, uh, but I was probably even now more of a, a moderate Democrat. I, I care. I still care about um, being somewhat conservative economically on balancing budgets if possible, but I'm much more progressive when it comes to uh, uh, human rights and so forth. I would say I fall closer within the Clinton family of thinking uh, in that area. Um, but uh, David Dinkins, I met uh, when he was mayor and I was, they were looking for quote, a, a, a name Republican. And since I was still a Republican out of Connecticut uh, and they, I'd met David uh, and he and I became friendly on the tennis court. Um, and uh, he said, I'm going to London. I'd love to take a few people. So I went with them there to help convince the British to maybe do more in the United States and in New York City. It was a trip in which I got to know David much better. He became a very close friend, came to my swearing in and so forth. But I, I had I was very active uh, for most of my life in, in helping. I, a little known fact, I was the only member of my class at Brown who joined the NAACP when they came to Brown when I was a sophomore. Um, and later on, I, I was active um, with David in, uh, in a number of black courses. Um, so when uh, I was sort of advisor to him, I had lots of experiences with him. He was a dear friend and uh, I, I was grateful that I had the opportunity to help that. Had he won the second campaign, uh, for his second term, I, I would never have gone to the federal government. I would have stayed. I would have been deputy mayor for economic development because mm -hmm. I was very fond of him and I would have wanted to have helped him. Plus, my family was it was easier uh, to be with the family and, and my grandchildren by then. It's the beginning. If uh, But as it turned out, going to Washington, it was a lucky break because my daughter lives in Bethesda and I was able to spend time with my grandchildren there. So I had a, I had the best of all worlds being in Washington those years. But that's a bit of the story of David. I spent a lot of time with David over the years talking on these issues. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's a good beginning, uh, certainly in political life, but your, your interests are more public policy than politics, I think. But Thomas Slate has been very uh, patient here. He's been he says, we've been worrying about inflation since the Carter administration. Is inflation really a risk this time rather than an excuse for slowing down a growing economy or to limit government spending? Um, you know, I, I failed to say something at the beginning that I do have to say before it ends and that uh, for those who are listening, it, it, Brian actually is, is a, was a factor in moving me towards public service because in 1994, uh, Clinton had, before I joined the government, had asked me to go on a trip to Haiti, uh, a mission to Haiti, which was led by Brian. I had never met Brian before and I had never been to Haiti. And it was a bit of an eye opener because there was lots of difficulties at Haiti then and there are today. Someday we should have an enterprise fund in in Haiti, uh, there's a lot of talent in the United States that are Haitian Americans that would probably help him to do a job. But uh, uh, there was a, a moment on that trip in which I was about to drink out of a local faucet and Brian stopped my hand and said, I would not drink that. Just come here and look out the window. <clears throat> I looked out the window and there down on the street below, they were filling some bottles with water from the tap. So it, it, I'm not sure I'd be here now had I been drinking what I was going to drink. So Brian sort of saved my life then. Plus, was a very good leader on, on the trip. So and we didn't see each other for some time, but I, I'll always be grateful for that one moment. So I'm sorry well, I got you away from that. We, that's a good way to, to start a friendship, Jim, and it's lasted for a long time. And I was delighted when I saw you on the Watson Board of Governors. But, uh, well... Thomas Slate wants to know about inflation. Should we worry about it? And, and is it just a, a, a ruse to stop spending uh, government money? Tax no, I think inflation is here. Uh, it's not likely to be the inflation that we dealt with in the 1970s, which got to double digits. Uh, it was a very, probably the most difficult part 
uh, from, from economic times that I lived through uh, and uh, took a lot of good work by uh, Chairman Volcker to, to turn us around then. Uh, I do not see that today. I do think that we are heading for um, uh, greater inflation, but not of that magnitude. And I do think that interest rates are going are gonna to be up, but not dramatically, but they're certainly going up now. We've lived for a long period of time with very unusually low interest rates, and um, it, 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 something was going to trigger it now. And I think that we have seen it now, and it's not going to pass easily without getting somewhat stronger. But I don't think it will be a crisis condition. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about the supply chain having been disrupted, and then all of a sudden the demand uh, goes way up because of the uh, hopefully the end of the pandemic. Uh, and that's that's uh, that's the hope is that no one knows. I mean, I listened to uh, Janet Yellen and and to uh, Powell uh, talk about it from the Federal Reserve, but they have a, they have mechanisms to to control. They'll have to raise interest rates if this continues and. I don't think they want to do it immediately because they think the economy is strong now and let's see what happens. But anyway, it's a, it's something that worries a lot of people, especially people that are on fixed incomes. Um, and uh, it's a lot of middle-class people in this country. So it's a political factor. Yes. Any other questions? I, I want to encourage people to ask questions. This is a, a, a resource that doesn't come around very often. Uh, I do think that uh, it's, a, the, it's a very interesting time. And I think for a lot of young people who, who, who complain about the, the difficulty because of uh, COVID and many of us being sequestered in our homes and all, I, I think it's a period of opportunity, uh, opportunity both in the public sector and an opportunity in, in the private sector. An opportunity, if you're willing and careful um, to do things internationally, uh, as there as there are domestically, so I'm I I see all sorts of potential uh, opportunities for young people that uh, I I notice when I talk to younger people they're not they don't see it clearly but I do I, I I think that it will come yes we will have a little inflation won't be the end of the world but yes interest rates will be higher again it won't be the end of the world it will be somewhat higher. I think the equity markets will probably be reflect that, and that's not a surprise. So we've been due for something like this now, um, but there are within that area there are really opportunities to do a lot of. If you're if you're interested in doing good and doing well yourself, there are oppor opportunities to do that. Uh, you don't have to do what I did work for for uh, 35, 40 years. 30 years until you go into the public sector, I would encourage people to think about the public sector much earlier than that. Um, and you can still do things in the private sector. The great thing about our government is that you can be working in the private sector and helping in the public sector. You don't have to necessarily go down and, and, and give up everything you've done. Um, you can be involved in both areas and that will give you good experience in public sector before you go in on a permanent basis. So lots of opportunities to do that. I didn't know that when I first graduated from Brown, uh, but there is, one can be working and still take some assignments and still be on a, on a advisory board in the public sector, uh, or you can do it in a local government, um, but you can be doing good things in the public sector while you're working in the private sector until you've made a decision if you want to go one or the other. Mm -hmm. Lot, lots of opportunity to do that. People who want to ask me questions, they can write to me uh, and I'd be glad to give advice to anybody who's thinking about doing something in, in, in any way similar to what I did in my life. Well, you couldn't be asking for advice from a better person, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to, uh, I don't see any more questions coming forward, but I, I want to end this by asking a question that might bring Ed Steinfeld back into the picture here. It relates to China. And, uh, you know, uh, we imposed some really tough tariffs on Chinese goods for a while. 
And it seems to me that in the period of inflation, that where uh, our consumers are suffering uh, as a result of those tariffs, and if there is any gesture that we could make toward a better relationship with China, maybe the time is now to remove some of the tariffs that were imposed by the Trump administration. I'll ask you, but I'll also ask Ed Steinfeld if he wants to comment on that as well. He's a China expert, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I, I think our relationship with China is quite important. Uh, so I would say, I, I put that, at, I, I remember saying to President Biden, I thought the first thing he should do and to, and to Blinken as well is, is think about how do we build the relationship with China. I think it is very, very important. And I, I still feel it's very significant now. I'm slightly encouraged by the relationship uh, on, on environmental discussions we had at, uh, at COP26 with the Chinese. So I'm, I think uh, I worry a lot about Russia all the time because I don't, I don't feel it's easy to work with my experience with Putin, but I think with the Chinese, we could do better. Yeah. I think so too. Ed, do you have a comment on, on that? I'd just be very brief. I think it's a great question. And, and, and I agree with Jim's response. I, I think it would be wise to, um, to maybe reduce some of the tariffs as a gesture to try to reestablish some kind of trust and some kind of relationship. And I say that not because I'm necessarily sympathetic to many of the things the Chinese government does, but rather because this relationship between the United States and China is so important for resolving a number of issues like the very important one Jim just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think what concerns me is that, of course, China in recent years has engaged in a number of behaviors which make a kind of a rapprochement difficult, but I think also the United States in our, in our own internal discourse have created a kind of situation where we in some sense, painted ourselves into a corner politically, and neither the left nor the right now has the kind of latitude to make a gesture like this. And, and I, I feel that's a real problem. If we're so politically constrained in the United States and so embattled internally that we've lost all or most diplomatic flexibility, that's a real problem to, to worry about. couldn't agree more. I've written a couple of articles saying we need to tone down the rhetoric and I think the latest meeting between Biden and the remote meeting with Biden and Xi was a very positive one in trying to create a more stable relationship and talking about guardrails around the different aspects of that relationship. But, but Brian, just, since you since you let me into this conversation, I'm, I'm yeah. barging in. I want to make sure though that I have a chance to 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 say something about this conversation. It's just marvelous, Jim. You're your book, of course, is fantastic. But for me, what a privilege, and, and I think I speak for the whole audience, what a privilege to listen to this conversation between two extraordinary individuals with such an amazing range of experiences. I, I'm really grateful to you both. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't put myself in Jim Harmon's category. I think he's wonderful, and his book is a good uh, demonstration of a life well lived. and. A one, a life of service, frankly. I mean, uh, I just think uh, Brown should be very, very proud of this, this graduate and he's given a, our students so much to think about today. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I'm, I have to respond by saying one, Ed, Ed you're doing such a great job at the Watson Institute. Um, I was so privileged to be on the board for a while. I think it's just a, come a long way under your leadership, it's terrific. And as I already told Brian, I think he he was he was great on that trip, great at, at USAID, um, terrific background. So Brown is fortunate, I think, to have both of you, um, and I intend to, to support you in any way I can to, to help out. I have one last Chinese story I will tell uh, that you alluded to in an email you sent me. That um, in my last year at Exim Bank, I was approached by the Chinese. Um, and they visited with me and they remember, they said, we'd, we'd like to learn more about export credit finance and what you do here. And I said, I, I, being, quote, interested in relationships. And I, I said, of course, we would love that. And then he, I said, he said to me, how do you feel about seconding some, some people to XM? I said, we're very supportive. We'd like to do the same. 
Maybe we can exchange some people. Uh, but then he just took me by surprise. He said, we, we've identified, uh, I think it was 42 people to be seconded to XM Bank. 42 people. The to- as Brian may know, the total size of X- XM Bank was only 500. So it would be suddenly 10% of our population. Of course, typical, uh, the, the State Department and everyone else were shocked at that number. And that it frightened the American government a little bit. And I remember saying to him, I, I, I don't think we can do that. And I'm, so we had a discussion on it. But I think I should have been, I should have persuaded him to accept four rather than right. bargain for 40. I mean, we would have gotten more, made more progress. And I, I, at the time, I was a bit, a bit shocked by the reaction of my counter my other departments in the government. Uh, but I wish I had done that because I think that having a relationship with China is very important and seconding back and forth is very important. It teaches us something and teaches them something. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity to exchange people. And we, we don't do enough of it uh, in, in the US. I'm a big advocate of that. I, I met the head of the XM Bank in Beijing. I told you about it. <clears throat> he was a Princeton graduate. <clears throat> if he had gone to Brown, maybe he would have had different attitudes. I don't know. <clears throat> but I, I'm a big fan of exchanging <laughs> as a former exchange student myself. Yeah. I think we should do more of it. Well, I think this has been a wonderful conversation, uh, Jim. I really appreciate I fr- appreciate you writing that great book, but I appreciate you spending time with us. And, and uh, thank you, Ed, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this. No, thank you for inviting me. It's my, been my privilege. All of my years at Brown, I, I look upon it as being just a, a very important part of my life. So if I can give back just a little bit to Brown, I, would, I want to do that, and specifically to the Watson Institute. Just terrific experience for me. So thank you both for, for doing this and for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Thanks to the audience. Very good. Thanks Bravo. to the audience. Bye-bye. Thank you.